We've all read about the extraordinary growth of Western classical music in China. And we have heard the mind-boggling statistics, the countless number of piano and violin students actively studying here today. Is it 40 million, 50 million, 60 million? We know that China has become the largest exporter and manufacturer of pianos, violins, and guitars in the world. More copies of Beethoven and Chopin are sold in China than in the rest of the world combined. Concert halls and opera houses are being constructed and filled up while those in the West are struggling. The conservatories throughout China are bulging with applicants many of whom end up filling spaces in North American and European conservatories or orchestras. As classical music seems to be receding in the West, here in, the, in China it seems to be having a renaissance. We sometimes say glibly that the future of Western classical music lies in the East. Well, I'm also aware that this growth has not taken place without problems and setbacks, and that music education in China still faces many hurdles, I see no reason to doubt that China will continue to play a growing role in the world of classical music theory and in classical performance. So what part will music theory play in this remarkable story? One rarely thinks about harmony textbooks or texts on Schenkerian analysis as part of the growth of music in China. Yet presumably, those hordes of students studying music will need some kind of theoretical instruction as part of their curriculum. Might we expect the same surge of theoretical activity as we have seen in music performance? It makes some of us in North America dizzy with the possibilities. Whereas at a typical textbook for class instruction with an audience of at most 10 to 20,000 students might be published, we could easily reach 15 to 20 times that number were the book translated into Chinese. Whereas our theory conferences might have an attendance of three to 400 scholars in a particular year, imagine 5,000 showing up. To sharpen the point, let me give you an amusing comparison. Before the appearance of the present translation, there was actually one earlier translation of the Cambridge History of Music Theory into, of all languages, Macedonian. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how many of you know uh, where Macedonia is on the map. I actually had to look it up myself. But it's a small country of about two million people that was part of the former Yugoslavia located just north of Greece. For reasons that are completely beyond my knowledge, some individuals in Macedonia thought that it was valuable to have a translation of the Cambridge history of Western music theory in their native tongue, although I confess to not knowing a single Macedonian music theorist. For that matter, I can't even recall meeting a single Macedonian musician, although I'm sure I must have at some point. In any case, a translation was launched there two years ago, alas, without any conference to accompany it, with the present translation of our Cambridge history into Chinese, though, we have now expanded by a factor of 650 the potential number of non-English readers, from some 2 million to potentially 1.3 billion readers. That is the economics of large-scale manufacturing in China. Well, I'm not deceiving myself that this book will enjoy a readership of 1 billion readers here. It's a very specialized book that will appeal to a small audience of scholars. And many of you who teach music theory in this room may well wonder, what use is a history of Western music theory in your curriculum? All those chapters on medieval modal theory, 17th century rhetoric, or 20th century neo-Rimanian theory, it sounds so antiquarian or erudite. What need do students have of that? It is a question I am frequently asked in the United States. Well, as you can guess, I do think that knowing something about the history of the discipline of theory is important. And if I may be somewhat impertinent, let me say that it is perhaps even more important for you in China who use theoretical models from the West in order to teach your music students now studying Western music. 
For even something as simple and seemingly obvious as putting down Roman numerals in an analysis of tonal harmony, or talking about sonata form when looking at a Beethoven string quartet, entails a host of epistemological assumptions and prejudices that have historical origins. You may be surprised to learn what I think the biggest lesson is of our Cambridge history of Western music theory, and it is this. There is no such thing as Western music theory. How can that be, you ask? What kind of joke am I playing on you? Well, let me take each word in order. To begin with, the subject matter of the book is not necessarily Western, at least in the homogeneous sense many of us think about it. Nor is the book always about music. Finally, the book never uses the term theory in any consistent way. Let me take these terms, these terms in reverse order, for as I deconstruct the title of my book, I think you'll see how that which we call Western music theory, much like Western music itself, is a complex, unstable, and not always obvious subject. First, theory. I'm not quite sure how you use and understand the term theory in Chinese, but in English, in the West, it often has a strong sense of scientific pretension. Perhaps we think of it as a set of empirical, testable propositions about reality. We talk about theories in fields of physics or biology, such as Einstein's theory of relativity. Likewise, many of us might think of music theory associated with the more systematic writings of someone like Heinrich Schenker or Johann Fuchs. But in North America, we also use the term for less elevated pedagogies of music that might entail very practical skills, such as sight singing or melodic dictation. In fact, we use the term in so many differing ways that I found it necessary in the Cambridge history to distinguish three general senses of the term. I got this idea from um, the late German musicologist and a former professor of mine, Karl Dahlhaus, who had suggested that music theory has three basic paradigms in Western traditions. And these are speculative, regulative, and analytic. You'll find a more comprehensive discussion of these three types in, of theory in my introduction to the book that you all now can see. For the moment, let me quickly summarize my arguments. And I think it's important for the theme of this conference. First, speculative theory. Speculative theory, musica speculativa, concerns the ontological nature of musical material. It is the oldest, in one sense, the most authentic tradition of music theory that can be traced back to ancient Greece and China, for that matter. I gather that Professor Yang just spoke um, a little bit about this historical tradition. It concerns itself with the nature of musical material and processes. Examples would be the meaning and explanation of consonants and whole number ratios or frequencies, origins of harmony in the overtone series, or perhaps in the movement of planets and stars. It might concern the explanations of music's effective power. Speculative theory does not seek to explain a piece of music, nor does it necessarily have practical implications. It is contemplative in the abstract, in a sense of platonic pursuit of pure knowledge. Ironically enough, in some historical traditions, speculative music theory may not even deal with music, at least as we understand it. It could deal with questions today we consider part of acoustics, cognition, or even astronomy, magic, medicine, and theology. Let me talk about the second type of music theory, regulative theory. This, on the contrary, is prescriptive knowledge that the music student can learn and apply to styles of music. Here, a theorist might seek to find rules and regulations for the grammar of music. Familiar pedagogical examples are rules for counterpoint, for four-part voice leading, for the structure of a sonata form. This is the kind of practical theory we typically associate with music theory textbooks. It shows us how music works. 
Perhaps, too, it can be useful for teaching a student to emulate a given style or genre in a composition. Typically, an instructor who teaches this kind of theory is located in some institutional setting, such as a conservatory, a school of music, or earlier in the West, in a church monastery. Finally, the third paradigm of music theory, analysis. Music analysis is a much more recent activity in the West, originating only in the 19th century. Here, the concern is upon the study and appreciation of selected master works of music. <coughs> Typically, we take canonical composers in the West, such as a Beethoven or Chopin, and look at one of their compositions in detail to try to understand how it is structured and perhaps why it seems such a powerful, exemplary work. The tools for analysis may vary widely and embrace both rigorously empirical methods as well as more subjective, critical evaluation. The point is not to teach the student how to write like Beethoven, which in a romantic aesthetic would be impossible in any case, Rather, the aim is to understand and appreciate what he did as a composer, perhaps to understand more how some of his greatest pieces were put together. Now, all three of these traditions, speculative, regulative, and analytic, are practiced in the West today and considered to be part of the program that we call music theory. But as I hope it is clear now, they do not always fit together comfortably. Each represents a differing intellectual tradition, a differing understanding of what theory is to be. And a great deal of confusion has arisen by musicians confusing these meanings. So when you read something about music theory in its title, the first thing you need to ask is, what kind of theory is the author talking about? I suspect that the differences in theory I have discussed here are familiar to many of you today. Um, as I don't think I need to tell you, China has a long tradition of speculative music theory that, as far as we can tell, predates by many centuries anything we have in the West. Throughout the Shang and Zhao dynasties, we have evidence that scholars were analyzing the place of music within a larger cosmic frame, much as ancient Greeks and Babylonians would do later. The correlation of musical sounds and relations to the movement of the heavenly bodies seems to be a constant in the early history and may be said to be the first and most authentic type of speculative music theory. But beyond this, Chinese scholars also applied mathematical and acoustical knowledge for the tuning of their musical instruments, reeds, strings, and bells, especially following the five-note pentatonic scale. So the number five in music was given a variety of cosmic homologies by Chinese musicians, just as the Greeks would later do for the number four in the musical Tetractus. One of the greatest innovations of musical practice, as you've already heard and know, equal temperament, was first mathematically calculated at, by a prince at the Ming court, Chu Chiu, in 1584. Yet Chu's aim was not practical in the sense that it would become in the West to play chromatic and transposable music on a keyboard. His innovation, based on the ritualized ringing of bells at an even chromatic cycle corresponding to the 12 months of the year, was largely an intellectual exercise. It was speculative in the most distinguished tradition of music theory. Let me say one more thing about traditions of speculative theory. From my discussion, you might think that all these kinds of speculative writings are obsolete and do not reflect current understandings and practices of music theory. But this is not true. There have always been scholars and scientists who continue to seek deeper understanding of musical material for its own sake, or I should say, at least independent of its practical applications. Such research is usually less cosmological than it is acoustical, mathematical, or perhaps cognitive. The work of many of my colleagues in North America on the subject of transformational theory that you will hear about in a paper tomorrow by Professor Klumpenhauer may be said to continue in this tradition. Transformational theory may have a practical or analytic application to be sure, but that is not a requirement. At heart, it is part of a time-honored discipline of the abstract exploration of musical material in its harmonic properties and potential. 
This is one reason that many music theorists in North America are employed as faculty at research universities. Music theory is there considered to be part of the liberal arts, as it was in the Western Middle Ages. To be sure, most of us also teach the more practical elements of music theory to our students. But unlike our colleagues in Europe, where music theory is more consistently located in conservatories and universities, we in North America are often called upon to do both, to teach practical theory to students and to carry on research and analysis. In short, to embrace all three paradigms of music theory that I have described above. I have no idea how this corresponds to the Chinese situation in your institutional structures, but I suspect that a similar tension will emerge in your disciplinary identity if it hasn't already. Let me now return to the deconstruction of my book title. If my book problematizes what we think of as music theory, it does the same for what we designate glibly as Western. There are so many regional and national distinctions in the West that it casts doubt on the efficacy of this term. The West, as you probably know, was never a single unified and organic whole. There were always tensions and disjunctions between countries and cultures, just as there certainly were between many Eastern cultures. Music history offers a perfect case study of differing musical traditions being introduced and absorbed, or sometimes rejected, between varying European countries. The same goes for writings and theories about music. We have always had a huge diversity of approaches in the West, as I have alluded to above in my distinctions between the three paradigms. And it is by no means a given that European musicians and listeners will necessarily understand one another better than an intelligent listener and musician from outside. This is where I think the current Chinese situation could be instructive. For we should not look at the reception of West European classical music by the Chinese simply through a model of cultural appropriation, as some distant society absorbing something that is foreign and alien to its indigenous culture. I recently read an interview by the British conductor and musicologist Christopher Hogwood, who came to Beijing a few years ago, probably at one of the conservatories here, to give a master class on Baroque music. And he discovered that all his students that he heard played Bach as if they were Tchaikovsky. And by no means, by the way, is that anecdote unusual. You'd hear the same complaint uh, in the United States today. The art of performing and hearing Baroque music is obviously a real challenge to many of your students today. But take comfort. It was also baffling for French listeners in the early 18th century who first heard instrumental counterpoint coming from Germany or Italians who heard, listened to French opera, or Russians who attempted to emulate Italian opera. The West is full of examples of people hearing music outside their own cultural bubble and being both enchanted and perplexed. The Chinese encounter with European art music over the past 40 or so years, then, is just one more chapter, albeit a dramatic one, of this story. And we should not forget, by the way, that the river has moved in both directions. There are moments in Western history where Asian music influenced us in our music theories. Already in the 18th century, thanks to Jesuit missionaries, French musicians were becoming aware of Chinese music, just as they were of Chinese culture in general, and they were making the first attempts to incorporate some of it in their own music and theories. The history of music everywhere in the world, and at every time, has been a history of assimilation and absorption. We can only expect this process to increase in tempo and degree, thanks to the, degree, the ease with which music can be transmitted instantaneously through technology and media today. Finally, if music has become so eclectic and hybrid in its nature, leading to what we call the global musical culture, Music theory might play a role here, helping us to translate the many musical languages to which we are now constantly exposed. For music theory is, if anything, a means by which people make sense of something that can be difficult, perplexing, and foreign, no matter where you are from. Put optimistically, music theory may well be a bridge by which music that is less familiar or congenial to you may be made comprehensible. Of course, theory itself needs translations, and I'm very grateful that we now have a Chinese translation of our Cambridge history in Chinese. 
But I hope our book makes clear that music theories, like music itself, has a historical origin and cultural context that needs careful analysis. No music theory is transcendental in its claim to truth. No theory exhausts what we can ask about music, whether a style, a composer, or a particular piece of music. The question to which a theory is addressed must always change depending on who is doing the asking and what their interests and needs are. This is another lesson that I hope our book teaches. Yet, it should be an encouraging conclusion for you. For your questions, your interest in Western art music are no less legitimate, no less urgent than those of us in, that are posed on the other side of the Pacific. And the uses you make of Western classical music, the theories that you devise to explore, explain, and teach this music, all will become eventually a part of our inheritance too. So music theory then will neither be Eastern nor Western, high nor low, and perhaps not even speculative or practical. It will instead be a subject of global dialogue among scholars, teachers, and performers and listeners who share a common love and curiosity for an art that will never exhaust itself. Thank you very much.